welcome to episode 131 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 21st of June, 2021. I'm Joe, and with me are Phelim. Howdy. Graham. Good evening. And Will. Hello. And miraculously, it's hot and sunny again now, even though it's only been about an hour. Oh no, hang on. It's still miserable and pissing down. Well, let's just get straight on with it. The suspense is killing me. So for first impressions, the random distribution button gave us Rebecca Black OS, which is a fan-made tribute to the singer that's based on Debian. So what did we think of this? Well, I thought that just like our music, the download didn't work properly because the, the, I saw that I got broke horribly. Right. Until you told me to use the one from a year ago, and then that did kind of work. So here's the thing. There is a stable release from about a year ago, and then there's a development release from relatively recently, and that development release is just fucked, basically. I tried to update it up once I got it installed, and it was just throwing me all sorts of dependency errors. You couldn't log into a KDE session. It was just... I mean, it's a work in progress. You can't really diss it too much. So when you go back to the older one, that does mostly work, I think. But um, weirdly, this project only lives on SourceForge, which is a bit like, uh, okay. And when you go to download it, by default, it gives you the 32-bit ISO, which is a bit weird. That's what made me go hunting for the um, different ISOs. So, Will, you had a bit of a shit time with this. Yeah, I downloaded the 32-bit version. I thought that was weird, but thought nothing of it. It booted in UEFI mode, but would only even attempt to install in BIOS mode for me. So I finally got that sorted out. But even then, it kept failing whenever it tried to partition the disk. It could see the disk. Some weird volume group thing was going on that I didn't understand. I couldn't delete the partitions. And then the button stopped working in the UI, so I rebooted into one of the other desktops that comes with it. And I thought that that was nice, actually, that you could have this selection of desktops from the live ISO and boot in and try them out. But um, the only one that worked reasonably well was KDE. But yeah, I still couldn't get it to install. So I went looking for the docs and didn't get on very well with that. There don't seem to be any. Uh, failed to install. The live session kept crashing out, and then I gave up. <laughs> right. Graham, did you get a chance to try it? Yeah, I did. I, I tried it today. I actually downloaded the latest ISO, the 64-bit ISO, and it booted up in EFI mode in KVM. So I got to play with the live session, we tried this many, many years ago on an old podcast for similar reasons before Wayland, but it was, you know, it was easier to test Wayland. And it, it looks, it's got the same kind of color scheme as XP, which maybe is accurate, but I couldn't get it to install. I, as soon as I tried to run the installer, it couldn't find the virtual drive that I created for it. So I didn't try much further than that, other than getting it running and having a look around. I did try some of the other window managers because it supports lots of the latest stuff. And I couldn't get them to work either, despite the fact that I was using something that ordinarily works with hardware acceleration. So it's not usually an issue on other VMs that I try. So I tried KDE on the year old one that you had suggested after we all had trouble with the, the more recent one because I couldn't get KDE to work on that other one. I kind of got GNOME to work, but it kind of crashed out. So I tried KDE on the, old, the year old one. And I was taken aback by how bad it looked. Yeah. And no, mm. this is not KDE looking bad. This is the, they are using the really old theme and the really old oxygen theme set. And it looks like it's almost like KDE 3. It's so out of date. I wondered whether it was KDE 3. Me too, yeah. It isn't though. I checked it and it's, it's actually 5.18. It's like, yeah. it's relatively mm. up to date. I mean, fair enough. It's a, a year old or whatever, but. There's no reason for it to look that bad. It's like they purposely removed the good-looking icons and themes. It's bizarre. You can change the theme and make it look relatively all right, though. Yeah, but the icon theme isn't even in there. Oh, right. So that's that's what... I, like, they would have had to go out of their way to remove that. Yeah. It's just a bit strange from top to bottom, this whole distro, isn't it? Because what the fuck has it got to do with Rebecca Black? Like, mm. there's not even any imagery, apart from RBOS, when you uh, boot it, the splash screen. 
there's basically nothing else. Like he specifically says that if you want to download her music, you've got to pay for it properly and there's no copyright stuff in this distro. Yeah, that was really disappointing because... <laughs> <laughs> you were looking to do a keyboard solo virtuoso over it, were you? I was looking forward to the weekend, to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> you just had to get down. But th- what is interesting about this distro, I think, is that it is Wayland. And when you boot into it in the first place, you get a choice of desktop environments. And the the list is fairly long. Default Western desktop shell, which is pretty ugly. Enlightenment, which is just Enlightenment. Gnome, which I actually found was the best for this distro. I'll get back to why in a second. Mm. Plasma, Leary desktop, which I tried and um, just there was no input at all. On the laptop I was using, the the touchpad, the keyboard, nothing worked. I plugged in an external mouse, nothing. So I don't know what was going on there. And uh, I had made the mistake of having it auto-log in to save a bit of time. I'm sure there are ways to fix it, but I just couldn't be asked. It was quicker to nuke and pave. But that was very frustrating. Then you got Sway, which is the i3-like one. Wavefire, which I don't think I tried. And then Western Low Graphics, which I don't think I tried. So you've got quite the uh, selection here. And is that maybe a bad idea? (laughs) Because you just end up with just this horrendous mashup of like having several terminals installed and just several different apps that don't really work very well across different desktops and stuff. It's like that thing of, you know, you read a newspaper article about tech and you just go, oh, this is absolute garbage. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, I felt like that when I saw the KDE that they had installed. And I just wondered, so if I feel like that about KDE or all the other ones, equally misrepresented of their environments or is it just some sort of KD spite and haha I make that one shite and that'll piss Phelan off but I, I'm not sure <laughs> well I think Gnome was just relatively stock wasn't it I found it was pretty broken there was some some missing assets some icons were missing and it replaced it with the default one for me and there seemed to be a, quite a lot of missing stuff from the um, start menu but that might have just been the version I was running, it looked okay. It looked like the theme had been applied correctly, but then certain bits of it seemed to be missing. Yeah. I I mean, I strongly get the impression that Rebecca just wanted to try a few different window managers and some cutting-edge technologies. No, this is nothing to do with her. This is unofficial and fan-made. Oh, I thought she had a couple of days spare at the end of the week and (laughs) thought she'd just try some of the next techno. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. (laughs) (laughs) One thing I found weird in wanting to try the different desktop environments was that I first tried KDE Plasma and I connected to my Wi-Fi network, which actually first involved me getting the blob for my wireless card because this is based on Debian and there's no proprietary blobs in there seemingly. So that was a bit of a ball like there. But once I'd connected to my Wi-Fi and then I was trying out GNOME, it would not connect to Wi-Fi no matter what I did. It just would not work. But then going back into Plasma, no problem. So I don't know quite what that's about. Very strange. But the reason I think GNOME is the best bet for this is because there's just so much shit installed that scrolling through the list of it in GNOME, like, you know, the what, what do they call that view where you press the nine squares buttons or whatever and it gives you the app grid or whatever launch pad on mac os <laughs> yeah launch pad whatever anyway so you get that and you can scroll through absolutely everything and see everything that's installed whereas with plasma you just the menus are too difficult to to find what what's in there and there was what's that is it simon the game with the th- is it three or four hmm. colorful yeah. things and th- yeah. they had a version of that but that was just broken just didn't work at all well, it's funny is I thought the exact opposite because when I lo- loaded up that, I don't know what you call it, the app menu in GNOME, all the apps that came up were KDE apps. And I just thought, okay, that's a bit weird. And they all had broken icons on them. So I don't think anybody could be happy with any of this because it doesn't do any of the desktop environments any favors, I feel. I feel we're being very harsh on this, but uh, ultimately, I think it deserves it, doesn't it? It's just not very good. I don't think we're very surprised, are we? Well, when I think of Rebecca Black, I think of professionalism and high production value. So this is this is just not cutting the mustard. <laughs> the weird thing is that she's going on tour again and announced it this week. Like, what are the odds that 
it would come up on the random distribution button yeah. for fucking week. <laughs> what are the odds, Joe? Yeah, what are the odds? <laughs> what, type of, what type of fan network channels are you connected into? <laughs> yeah. How did you know? It is pure cosmic coincidence, man. It was not fixed. But uh, maybe we can uh, ride on her SEO or something. And we'll get a lot yeah. of confused fans checking this, <laughs> this episode out. The fuck are these guys talking about? KDE? Link back to her MySpace. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This brings up a broader question, doesn't it? And Will, you're basically done with this experiment at this point. I feel like we are comparing different themes of the same thing here. We see an installer and it's a KDE installer or it's a GNOME installer. We see a desktop environment, it's you know one of one of three. And then we use a browser and we configure a Wi-Fi and then we're done. And they're all basically the same, as far as I can tell. And I don't know if that's because there's a level of standardization across all of Linux desktop or desktop generally, and things can only be done a certain number of ways. And we have now witnessed all of the ways that it is possible to do a thing. Or if there's just a lack of um, new ideas um, or something else. And so I feel like we're not going to make any interesting discoveries. We're going to find more broken or semi-broken distros that we uh, laugh at, and then we don't really do any good. I think you make a reasonable point. I thought that it would last a little bit longer than this, because we've only done two or three, haven't we? Could it be the random nature of us choosing? I mean, if it is really random, the fact that... Maybe this is that 90% of the distros are like Will says, but by doing that, but perhaps missing the 10% mm. that could be doing something unique. So should we start taking suggestions then? Because we've already mm. had them. And last time or two weeks ago, we said like, no, we're going to keep it random. But should we be doing stuff like uh, Silver Blue, for example, which is a genuinely different concept? I thought this was going to be a right nightmare of a, a section to do because I'm pretty set in my ways. But when once we did Nixos, I was really surprised and I hadn't seen anything like that before. Mm. And I thought that was really good. So if there's more gems out there a bit like that, then I would think we should do it. But maybe with a more structured sort of suggestions might be the way to go. Mm. You realise we're going to open the floodgates now. Maybe we could put them on like the wheel of meh and then choose between them. <laughs> yeah. That's a good idea, actually, yeah. Selectively randomised. Yeah. Can we throw a few apps in there as well so we could start looking mm. at uh, a distro one week and, well, if the spinning wheel of meh comes up with uh, you know a particular application, then we try that as well. Okay, so are we going to solicit suggestions for apps as well as distros then? Yeah, I think so, but... You know, don't just tell us about your favourite new browser. Let's have something that's a little bit more um, interesting. I would go so far as to say no browsers because I'm not changing from Firefox, so it's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it needs to be something we can try out relatively briefly because, you know, I can't expect you lot to spend, you know, days and days and days checking stuff out. And, and not necessarily just GUI apps either. Maybe terminal apps might be uh, a good thing to try out. And uh, yeah, maybe that's what we should do, compile a list. But what are we going to do for this time in two weeks' time then? Should we do Fedora Silverblue first? Sure. Let's try it. Yeah. Yeah, let's go for it then. All right, yeah, let's do that because that is genuinely different. Just everything about it is different pretty much. Right, well, we'll do that in two weeks then. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Linode. Go to linode.com slash late night Linux and see why Linode has been voted the top infrastructure as a service provider by both G2 and Trustradius. From their award-winning support offered 24-7, 365 to every level of user, to ease of use and setup, it's clear why developers have been trusting Linode for projects both big and small since 2003. Deploy your entire application stack with Linode's one-click app marketplace or build it all from scratch and manage everything yourself with supported centralized tools like Terraform. Linode offers great price-to-performance value for all compute instances, including GPUs, as well as block storage, Kubernetes, and their upcoming bare metal release. Linode makes cloud computing fast, simple, and affordable, allowing you to focus on your projects, not your infrastructure. So go to linode.com slash late night Linux, create a free account with your Google or GitHub account or your email address, and you'll get $100 in credit. That's linode.com slash late night Linux. On to a bit of admin then, and thank you everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. You can go to late night support if you want to learn more about that. 
And remember, for $5 or more per month on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed. And latenightlinux.com slash contact if you want to get in touch with us. And just a quick reminder about our Foss Talk live show. Definitely go and uh, watch the video of that and get us more views than the Ubuntu podcast. Link in the show notes. Let's do some feedback then. Now, this first one is hilarious. Mike wrote into us last time we did feedback, defending Arch. And then he tweeted at us, <laughs> after six months of seamless <laughs> Arch usage, I finally wrote in to defend Arch. You read it on air. Then, the next day, an Arch update breaks my system. Well done, you. <laughs> <laughs> I should have read the wiki. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, yeah. In Arch's defense, I heard a good thing about that from someone who wanted to remain nameless, and it's not Graham, so there's more than one Arch user. And it was the fact that, you know, development upstream of the likes of KDE and stuff, they find it really sort of hard to, to track when there's a really ancient version of something in a distro, even if it's six months to a year old. And how disheartening it can be that, you know, they say, oh, we know this thing is fixed upstream if you could just use that. And I can see that point of view as well. Uh, but I do still think it is absolutely hilarious that this thing broke after six months. Yeah. So we had a couple of people write in about the changes with Firefox. So uh, Omui, I think that's how you say it, uh, said, I heard one of the hosts complaining about the changes in Firefox UI. While it's all reasonable, in fact, none of the changes matter when you can customize the UI using CSS. And then he says, give this a try, which is custom CSS for FX, which I assume is Firefox. It's as simple as creating a Chrome directory in the Firefox profile directory, and then you extract the zip in there, and then you can edit the CSS to uh, enable or disable a feature, which is really straightforward, apparently. So, uh, yeah, I, I kind of knew about that, but uh, it's good that we'll have a link to that. And similarly, Josh said that classic Firefox 88 tabs and 89 floaty tabs both take up too much real estate. The solution is vertical and hierarchical tabs using the tree style tabs add-on. For even more space saving, the sidebar is able to be hidden and viewed with F1 by default. No, I don't like that. No. I don't like, I mean, it sort of makes sense to put stuff on the side, but then that's what Unity tried, and I, I never got on with that either. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know, I just can't do it either. I can't even have that bookmarks thing open on the left-hand side. It just mm. drives me mad. I got two bars are up the top, and that's it. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I've tried it as well, and I can't get on with it. I think, because I also have a wide screen, I have, like, normally three browser windows open side by side, each one of them with, like, 20 tabs. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm so surprised by this news. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do like the idea of that CSS tweaking. It just seems like you're playing with fire and I use my browser for work and I just can't have it break. And I don't know, it just seems like messing around in CSS and all that. It's going to break horribly. I'll have to delete the profile or something. I don't know. I'm sure it's probably completely fine and I'm just being over the top with it, but mm. it just didn't need to change and it just looks shite and just stop, stop, Mozilla, stop. Well, Josh chucked in a couple of links as well that we'll put in the show notes if you want to get into this. But I agree with you, Phelim. Once you start messing with CSS, you are playing with fire. You're just going to end up with just a fucked browser and having to reset to defaults. And exactly what you said, just no, it's, uh, I don't have time for that. I just put up with the changes and just grumble about it and uh, just accept it. So Jens writes in about the barking dogs. Why not look at the problem from a practical design angle and find the actual issue to be solved instead of finding a feature to be implemented? Dude with the neighbor's dog barking wants to be, not be woken up by neighbor's dogs barking. So instead of going at this system of machine learning and sound analyzing, why not put the dog whistle on his nightstand or somewhere around the house? Every time he notices the dog barking, when it's an issue, he just blows the dog whistle for five seconds. If he doesn't notice it, it's not an issue. So no need to train that away from them. When he does notice and gets annoyed by it, middle of the night or whatever, it obviously is, and he can manually use the whistle to make them shut up and perhaps learn from it. Not as fun, but less work, cheaper, easier, and making use of already available tech without overcomplicating the problem to get some strange tech in there. Jens, not fun at parties. <laughs> yeah, uh, I suppose this, um, this actually does illustrate potentially a problem with people who are into computers and stuff generally that we like to overcomplicate things mm. and maybe just a really simple solution like this is the best one 
Remind me to tell you about my Wi-Fi connected light switches. Unrelated. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I think you're onto something there, Jens. Okay, this episode is sponsored by CBT Nuggets, training for IT professionals or anyone looking to build IT skills. Go to cbtnuggets.com slash late night Linux and sign up for a seven day free trial. The on demand virtual labs mean you can build practical experience with the commands, config, scripts, and everything you need to get the most out of each course. Another standout feature is the accountability coaching service, available to all learners with a subscription, which gives you access to a real person who will help you craft a personalized learning plan and set goals and will check in with you to keep you accountable. So start your free seven-day trial today at cbtnuggets.com slash late night Linux. It includes unlimited access to all course materials, including virtual labs. That's cbtnuggets.com slash late night Linux. So we did some of the leftover questions from Foss Talk Live last time, and we've got even more leftover now. So uh, <laughs> let's do them. It was good fun. All right. What is Linux in 10 years? Obsolete, irrelevant, <laughs> replaced by Fuchsia. I think it will be a Kubernetes base operating system and very little else. Just seeing this question come up, I quickly Googled what was Linux 10 years ago. And I think uh, was it, I think the kernel just went to 3.0 at the end of that year. Um, it was Debian 6. And so things, you know, right, orchestration, much more cloud deployment, Docker, all that kind of stuff has kind of been and, and risen over the last 10 years. I'd like to try and stay positive, although what you just said about future and everything is, you know, kind of the worst nightmare that what could happen. I'd say that in another 10 years, we might be in a similar place. I don't think we'd be any worse off, but we'd probably, you know, I'll be getting pretty old by then. <laughs> I think we'll be in a good place. I think there's a lot to be taken as a positive from what's going on right now. I mean, every single server out there is going to be running Linux. I honestly don't think Fuchsia is going to be much of an issue at all. I think that's going to get killed off in about, let's see, six months time, maybe? Yeah, let's give it six mm. months. It'll be killed off. <laughs> I'm going to play this back to you, Fanny. <laughs> oh, I fucking look forward to it. And I'll be sitting there playing every game that's available on Steam by that point because uh, all of the patches will be in and... Uh, there won't be a Windows and uh, Mac will have folded. And um, yeah, no, I'd like to think that was the case. I really, really hope people kind of cop on about cloud based stuff because I just think we are throwing away so much expertise into a marginal corral of a, a few people. And I would hate to see all the skill and, you know, sort of the multitude of different companies that are out there disappear just by everything getting conglomerated into like five odd companies so uh i'm hopeful i think realistically in 10 years most of what we know as the cloud and orchestration and stuff that will be on fuchsia by then i think that it'll be all containers running on a fuchsia base and it ultimately won't make much of a difference to most people who use it i think linux will still be around because open source projects generally don't just disappear do they I think it'll be something of a hobbyist OS on the desktop and maybe on some servers. And I think that things like Arch will be around, Debian will still be around, but I don't think that it will have this huge grip on infrastructure. Like all infrastructure, more or less, is running Linux. I genuinely think that Fuchsia is coming to eat Linux's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we are in 10 years, definitely, we're going to see that. But Linux will still be around and, you know, Phelan, you'll still be tinkering with, you know, there'll be some sort of Plasma 9 or whatever by then. And uh, you'll still be happy and you'll still be able to SSH into various servers and you'll still, you know, there'll still be free BSD appliances and boxes and there'll still be Linux distros set up for, you know, doing small business deployments or whatever, it won't have completely gone away, but I think just it won't have anywhere near the dominance that it has now. I think you're delusional. I think there's no way it's going to be that big of a deal. And yes, I can see the soft rollout of Fuchsia, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I just don't. Who could trust Google, honestly? If you're basing your company on one of their products, how the hell could you trust them with all the things they've killed off? You just can't. So I don't think anybody should. And uh yeah, just, just don't do it. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Entroware. Go to entroware.com. 
EntroWare sells computers with Ubuntu and Ubuntu Mate pre-installed. They have a range of desktops, laptops, and servers, and most parts are configurable, so you can pick the CPU, RAM, and storage that's right for you. Check out their new Proteus laptop. With an 11th gen Core i7 option with XE graphics, 73 watt hour battery, Thunderbolt 4 with Type C power delivery and display output, up to 4 terabytes of NVMe storage, and a 15.6 full HD display with an ultra thin bezel, and also their new Poseidon desktop, which has 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, an 11th gen Core i9 option, up to 128 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM, up to 16 terabytes of storage all in a sound dampened case. They ship to the UK, Republic of Ireland, France, Germany, Italy and Spain. And if you do buy one of their machines, there's a little drop down at checkout where you can select late night Linux so that they'll know that we sent you. So go to entroware.com for all your Linux computing needs. Okay, so here's one. Who do you trust most? Apple, Google, Facebook or Amazon? We answered who we trusted least on the live show but who do we trust most? So, Faleb, I've got to go to you first because none of the above is not an acceptable answer. Can, can we quote you on this? Yeah. I have question marks on the page where I thought about this for about a week <laughs> and I still don't know. I genuinely do not know. Yes, you do. We all know what the right answer is. Probably. Go on. Apple. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Probably. I'm not entirely sure. I believe I am still here in this chair. I may Endorsed have been replaced by, by a uh, <laughs> glass and carbon <laughs> copy of myself. Apple. Super trustworthy. <laughs> Signed by Phelan. <laughs> Clearly. Clearly, Apple is the answer here. No, there's no clear answer in any of that quagmire of shite with those four choices. They're <laughs> awful. I'm surprised you didn't put Microsoft in there as well, for fuck's sake. Yeah, could have done. But Apple's business model is the most straightforward, and you can trust them to sell you expensive shit and services. It's that simple. <sighs> We're all cogs in the machine of making money. I don't think I have to trust them at all. But it's all about the simplicity of the business model to me. That's why... You can trust them to be a ruthlessly capitalist company that is going to charge you as much as they can possibly get away with for products that are probably quite good and services that are quite good. And yes, it's horribly proprietary and all the rest of it and lock in and like we talked about with uh, sideloading apps and everything and that not being a thing on iOS. But you can trust them to be ruthlessly capitalist, whereas the other three, I mean, Amazon to a similar extent, I would say, but I mean, especially Google and Facebook, I mean, fuck them. Like th their business is so complicated that no, Apple is the, the clear winner for me. It's a taller than Ronnie Corbett competition. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what about you, Will? Yeah, Apple, obviously. Um, I think Amazon is interesting. If you look at the sort of AWS side of things, then I think the business model there is pretty straightforward. And that AWS feels like it's a more trustworthy organization. They're, they're more of a sort of business-to-business -business kind of relationship. But then you get down into the Amazon, whatever you call it, like sale, direct selling thing that they do, and you know how many cookies they have and how they track you across the web and how they listen to everything you say through those home devices and all that sort of thing. Then I think that rules them out. And so the, the winner must be Apple. Do we not just think that this is because Apple is unable to have realized that, though? I bet they'd love to be in that position. I bet they've tried, but they just can't manage it. But what would they sell you? More iPhones? I don't know. Well, they want to sell you iCloud and Apple TV Plus, and they've probably got some mm. other shit that I don't know about. That's surely where they want to make their money, because it's all about recurring revenue rather than just you know, selling expensive shit. Because in a way, iPhones and watches and iPads and Macs are somewhat recurring in that you have to replace them every X number of years. But something where you're paying monthly or annually for a service, that is much better for the bottom line for any company. I think Apple do a very good job of putting their service front and centre. And I imagine that most Apple users 
just say, oh, right, I need to back up my photos, fine, I'll just pay Apple, whatever it is they cost, I don't know. Hmm. Whereas if you want to use Google Photos on an iPhone, for example, you have to jump through a few hoops, you have to find the app, you have to know about it, you have to install it. If you want to use music, well, yeah, sure, you can install Spotify, but they'll go out of their way to give you a free sample of Apple Music and, and all of that stuff. So I don't think that they need to necessarily know what you're up to. I think that um, you tell them by, you know, signing up to these services by going into these menu options and by clicking on the things inside the apps. So I, 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 I'm I, sure they do track you. I'm sure they've got lots of tracking cookies, but I don't think they're, they're in it in the same way that, say, Google are. Something else that I think you and Joe kind of touched upon is that there's lots of internal competition at Google, Facebook and Amazon. So even if you can trust like the Google Reader team or whoever it happens to be, you can't necessarily trust the people who are implementing the ads tracking in Gmail. Whereas Apple, at least on the surface, seems to do a very good job of keeping everything self-contained and having a single story. And I'd be the same. I think it's a tough decision between these four, but I'd choose Apple. I also quite like what they're doing with locking down tracking on their devices. I think that's been a good initiative. Right, well, we'd better get out of here then. We'll be back next week when hopefully things will have been happening in the news and we'll be talking about that, but who knows. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Phelan. I've been Graham. And I've been Will. See you later. <laughs>